All right, so I'm going to, we're going to continue on the India path. Um, I just thought I would break up uh, uh, some things and kind of try to keep you with me here. There's this really a beautiful and amazing <clears throat> um, set of monuments that are considered world heritage sites um, uh, in India that um, have all these uh, erotic sculptures. I just thought I would show you. Um, yes, uh, that's really there. And yeah, right. <clears throat> um, so if anybody remembers the Spice Girls, there was, uh, that song, if you want to be my lover, you got to get with my friend, you know, that one. All right. So anyhow, they wanted to play in front of this temple, a concert, right? Uh, obviously they thought that would have been maybe kind of sexy or whatever, but uh, many Hindus objected to this, and uh, one person said that this represents the cyclically of life, uh, um, uh, 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 cyclicalness or whatever. Anyways, that um, it says eroticism sans spirituality or eroticism without spirituality will be reduced to pornography. By making those temples an erotic prop to their performance, the Spice Girls would be hurting the sentiments of centuries and centuries of sacred creativity in India. So I just kind of wanted to show that as, as, as a nice little kind of distraction uh, um, uh, in the middle of being overwhelmed with so much information um, that, you know, the, the, the topic of sexuality in Hindu religion uh, is obviously different, but I think that's an interesting uh, a kind of thought that you know this idea of, of 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 eroticism without spirituality is reduced to pornography while for many people they would look at those objects all connected in sexual positions as being straight up pornography but that's not the case so anyways um i just thought that i would uh, uh show you that okay moving on to ancient india part two um so we end up with the end of the Vedic era uh, in around 500 BCE. And what we're going to see is the rise of Buddhism within India. Um, and then we're also going to see India greatly enhancing its connections with others and also it being uh, facing some conquests uh, um, themselves. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go briefly over certain things. I just want to point out that Persians did rule in India. And remember the Persians uh, also uh, for a time ruled uh, Egypt and the Persians uh, took control um, and influencing of, uh, of ancient Israel. So again, you know, we're linking all of what we've been learning together. Okay. Um, and so that's something I just kind of want to um, draw attention to. I'm going to move kind of quick along these things. So Greeks also invade India. Uh, remember Alexander the Great um, and how he gets everywhere. Um, you know, he's going to come up over and over. Alexander the Great is like Napoleon. They just pop up everywhere all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the use of war elephants um, are, are in this battle. But the important thing is I just wanted to show is that even... Uh, um, there is a, a, a connection with Greece in India. Um, I'm going to move on. Now, an important empire was the Maur uh, Maurin uh, Empire. And this is from the 4th century to 184 BCE. Um, here, what's just important that I wanted to point out is that uh, they used Persian administrative methods and Macedonian military techniques that they learned in their contacts uh, with them. And so, like all cultures, again, we see that warfare and occupation and all these things, that everything is always uh, uh, transplanting other cultural um, ideas into another area of the world and that despite how unique we can all be you keep seeing this uh you know fusion of different ideas that come from other places um okay i want to talk mainly about 
Ashoka, though. So I want to focus on him um, because I think he's probably one of the most interesting uh, and unique rulers that I've ever come across. And in case you haven't noticed, I, I read a lot of world history. And um, it's... I, I, I've yet to find anybody with a legacy like his. Um, he ends up ruling between uh, 270 and 322 BCE. He became one of the most memorable of this dynasty. Um, now, he defeated his brothers in a bloody civil war. He, his life starts off extremely violent. And then there is a battle on the east coast of Kalinga. And he sees his armies just slaughtered thousands and thousands. Now, almost every like famous warrior that you come across in history, it's almost like their bloodlust increases as they kill, kill, and kill, and kill. But in the case of Ashoka, he sees this and something about this event at Kalinga completely rips his heart. It, 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 he, he gets something that we actually call a conscience, right? And he doesn't want to be that person anymore. He doesn't want to, to be a part of death and destruction anymore. So he changes. He has a, a, a transformation. And he becomes remorseful of violence. Uh, he became a Buddhist, giving up hunting, eating meat, and a, a, a te- attempted to practice uh, ahimsa, the acts of nonviolence that we talked about. Um, he spread Buddhism throughout the empire. Uh, he funded Buddhist institutions, scholars, and artists. And he built numerous uh, amounts of roads, shady trees, water spots, hospitals, irrigation systems. And he didn't try to per- persecute other religions. Uh, he helped uh, Jains and Hindus maintain their shrines and promote their worship as well. So it's quite a legacy um, that he has. Um, he, uh, again, as a contributor to Buddhism, though different, obviously, than, let's say, Constantine and Christianity, he does help kind of create, uh, uh, intervene as a facilitator to uh, this religion. So he he has a third Buddhist council in 250 and uh, it was held by the monk aimed at the purification of the movement. It formalized Buddhist texts and had the idea of sending missionaries. We don't think of Buddhism and missionary work, but remember I was telling you how, you know, I know obviously many of you probably think of China as strictly Buddhist or you go to a Thai restaurant and you see Buddhism there. Well, well, how did uh, Buddhism come from India into these places? Um, Buddhism actively uh, went out at at a certain point to um, draw people in. Um, And so um, that's just something important that I want to say. So Ashoka, he's an interesting leader and he also also has an influence on the spread of Buddhism. Um, But uh, again, I, I think that you should you know, if you want to look into an interesting leader in, in history, he's one of them. Um, his successors were not as effective or, or as kind as him, uh, at least after his violent legacy. Um, the empire eventually is going to fall in the second century BCE. And then for about five centuries, it's a long time, India is back with political disunity and a series of small kingdoms emerge uh, once again. Um uh, let's see here. So um, we have other dynasties that end up uh, uh, ruling, which connect with China more. Um, the Kushans. Um, I just again, I, instead of focusing on you knowing about them, I just want you to kind of see where the uh, you know we have Rome, we have China, and we have India. And then we have these separate little kingdoms here. So I kind of want you to just visualize and try to bring in together uh, um, everything that we're learning. Okay. So again, here, ancient Israel would be right here. Here's Parthia. Here's the Persians, right? Romans, 
India, and then China. Okay, so all right, um, I'm gonna end there, and I'll go back to the next lecture.